This year, we have decided to make the best papers of the last SESEC meeting. And this one is about shoulder instability. Our faculty is, we are the moderators, co-moderator uh, myself from Turkey at the Janatalar and education committee uh, chair, Gabor Skalicki from Hungary. And our expert commentator, uh, he will comment about the uh, presentations, Paolo Palladini, he is our former chair of the education committee. Now uh, it's time for presentation. And the first presenter is Philip. Please, Philip. Good evening, SETSEC community. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, Atachan and Gabo. And also, obviously, thanks to the SETSEC office and Paolo for organizing this. Let me try to share my screen. So it's my great pleasure to present our research on the shoulder pacemaker treatment for functional posterior shoulder instability. This was a multicentric prospective randomized control trial. Uh, and I would also like to thank all the co-authors that you can see listed below. Before I start with my presentation, I would like to point out a relevant conflict of interest as I was involved in the development of a device that was tested in this randomized control trial. Whenever you see patients in your clinical practice that dislocate their shoulders posteriorly during every elevation motion of the arm, as you can clearly see in the fluoroscopic images, and at the same time, their MRI scans turn surprisingly negative. So this means you cannot see any structural defects on the MRI scans. Then you have to think about the so-called functional posterior shoulder instability as opposed to a structural posterior shoulder instability. So to explain, a functional posterior shoulder instability is not caused by any labral tears or any bone loss or any reverse heel sucks defects. It's rather caused by a wrong muscle activation pattern. There's muscles that are hypoactive and other muscles that are hyperactive. And this leads to this very severe type of shoulder inst instability, which we like to call functional posterior shoulder instability. To test this in clinical practice, I like to use the so-called show-me test. The show-me test is uh, likely the easiest test in orthopedics. You just sit back and relax and ask the patient to raise the arm. And if you can see a uh, dislocation um, that's occurring when they raise their arm, then actually you likely have a functional shoulder instability standing in front of you when the MRI scan is negative. So... In the past, we have published about the so-called shoulder pacemaker treatment concept for functional posterior shoulder instability. This is a motion activated neuromuscular electrical stimulator. So it's a treatment that uh, actually derives uh, from the treatment of stroke patients because we believe that the problem is not the muscles and it's not the labrum and not bone loss. It's rather the activation pattern and the coordination of these muscles. And in order to retrain and reactivate previously hyperactive muscles, we introduced this motion activated NMES concept. And this has picked up some speed. We were able to publish this. It has been picked up by other, other groups that have used this to treat their patients and even got some videos and a bunch of likes on YouTube and so on. And whenever something new is brought to the scene uh, and there's a certain hype that's involved with it, I think it's our responsibility to also test this on a very sound scientific basis because we have seen so many orthopedic treatments come and go, you know, in the initial, initial phase, there's always some hype and excitement about it. And then when you test these treatments uh, against uh, a good control, then actually the benefit is not as clear. And so the devices do not stand the test uh, of a scientific evaluation. This is why we set out to produce a multicentric randomized control trial in uh, different centers, evenly distributed within Germany, so that the geographic spread was so that our patients could re easily reach the centers. We included patients with non-controllable functional posterior shoulder instability, and they were randomized to either receive conventional physiotherapy, which is uh, the gold standard that was defined based on a Delphi survey amongst experts, or to the same type of physical therapy. However, with simultaneous shoulder pacemaker treatment, which is the motion activated NMES concept. 
We had the data not analyzed in Germany, but rather stored in Switzerland. Uh, Laurent Odiger took care of that, of central data monitoring and data analysis. So we also did not have access to the data analysis. And we had uh, an international independent expert review panel that took care to supervise the trial and trial decisions. After screening and enrollment of the patients, they were randomized one-to-one, -one, as mentioned before. Then they were treated for six weeks in either group. And after the six weeks, we waited for another three months. And after this three months time period, we obviously got some outcomes course. And if the patients were not happy with the outcome, they were allowed to cross over to the other intervention group. So this could go obviously in both directions. And we followed up the patients thereafter for 12 months. We collected the typical outcome scores, including the VOSI scores, adverse events, instability events, strength, range of motion, pain, subjective shoulder value, improvement, and satisfaction. So this is the rather busy study flowchart. So uh, this trial got quite complicated uh, with non-operative treatment. It's quite difficult also to keep the compliance of the patients up. So we certainly had some compliance problems. However, they were non-differential in both groups. So the comparison seems to be quite fair. We had a 86% follow-up uh, in one cohort uh, at the three months time point. Um, and then we had 71% follow-up um, at the one year time point. We had 24 patients included in the PT plus shoulder pacemaker group and 25 patients in the PT alone group. If we analyze the group comparability, we see that the patients are quite comparable. If anything, then we can say that, um, that the shoulder pacemaker group was slightly worse off with a little bit more instability. But other than that, there was no difference between both groups. So they were comparable. So after the intervention, we can see the following outcome. The main outcome measurement was the Bosis score. And this is depicted on the chart that you can see on the left-hand side. In uh, dark blue, you can see the trajectory that the shoulder pacemaker patients took. And in orange, you can see the conventional physiotherapy patients. You see at baseline, this is adjusted from baseline. You can see that the physiotherapy group started off quite nicely. They had some improvement, but already at the three months time point, unfortunately, they already almost completely lost the benefit that they got from the intervention. And this was actually not significant anymore from baseline. So the, the outcome was actually not that great. And then we allowed to cross over these patients uh, into the other intervention group, including shoulder pacemaker. And you can see that even in this negative selection, the patients were still uh, able to get a significant improvement from the added uh, motion activated neuromuscular electrical stimulation. As you can also clearly see on the dark blue line, that saw a quite nice increase in VOSI score uh, after the intervention. This was kept uh, constant for the course of one year. So the VOSI score was significantly better. The stability rate was better. They had less discomfort, higher subjective improvement and patient satisfaction. And even in the crossover group, this seems to be true. This is an example of a patient that uh, was not doing that nice after three months after the intervention in the conventional physiotherapy group. You can see, still see her dislocating her shoulder posteriorly, so a positive show me test. And uh, then you can show her or can see her after the crossover into the pacemaker group at the six months time point. She's doing quite nicely there. And also at the one year follow up, you can see her doing nice, uh, nicely and having a stable shoulder again. So obviously we need to discuss these results. So what we believe to be true is that uh, neuromuscular electrical stimulation that is motion activated is actually able to cause a neuroplastic effect in these patients. By uh, doing so, they change the motion activation patterns. And by doing so, they actually are able to regain a stable shoulder function. We don't think this is a strengthening device because the patients did not have a strength deficit pre-interventionally. And they also did not have more strength after the intervention. So actually what was going on was not a muscle training. It was actually a brain re-education. At least that's what we believe. We also had some limitations. We had to stop uh, the recruitment early after 59 out of 66 patients due to flattening of the recruitment curve, but we were able to reach sufficient statistical power. Eligibility and compliance issues were present in both groups. However, they were non-differential as mentioned. 
we had an unblinded treatment allocation. The primary outcome was already taken after three months because the crossover had to be allowed uh, for also ethical reasons uh, for the patient to be able to cross over in both groups. And the effect was sustained uh, up to 12 months. And finally, we had less benefit compared to the first published results that we also published from our own data. Uh, this is likely attributable to the learning curve because in this case, the shoulder pacemaker was handed to physiotherapists that did not use it before without further, just some instruction, but without further training. We had less compliance of the patients and we also had probably less confirmation bias than in the first introduction to the literature of this new treatment method. So in conclusion, we are able to claim that uh, statistically significant and clinically relevant improvement of outcome can achieve with uh, the shoulder pacemaker enhanced physiotherapy. And even patients with failed prior conventional physiotherapy might be able to benefit from the shoulder pacemaker therapy. So thank you very much. And thanks again to all the participants uh, and colleagues who participated in this trial and had this uh, to get this study done with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, for this very impressive work. And uh, now we will listen to uh, the comments of uh, Dr. Paolo Palladini. But before I ask from the audience, please send your questions with uh, chat or q and I will check both boxes. And at the end of the session, we will make a discussion with your interactive questions. Yes, Dr. Pardini. Thank you, Philip, for this interesting presentation. I just, uh, before doing my uh, uh, my comment, I would like to know if you find some interesting differences in people who came to you without any cause of uh, this uh, posterior instability and people that developed this this posterior instability maybe after a crash accident, a car accident, or uh, a sportive accident, because I think that we we can have different results. And in my opinion, in my experience, we have different results. If you have a, a people coming to you without any trauma, without any uh, starting trigger point, and the people that came to you maybe after a, a, after a, a crash or something else, did you find any difference in this kind of people? It's interesting that you mentioned that not in this trial in particular, but we have published on this uh, before. So what is the, the ideal patient for this treatment and what are the patients where it might not work uh, just as nicely? Uh, and you're completely right. Um, it makes a difference whether this is a traumatic cause or not. In theory, they are all atraumatic. In practice, they come to you and might be mentioning a slight trauma, you know, something like, I don't know, they did some gymnastic exercise and then they felt their shoulder popping out for the first time. And after that, it was just everything went went downstairs. You know, everything. And one woman that was just carrying a bag. Getting yeah. a bag. Yes, nothing yeah. else. So is this an adequate trauma? I don't think so. However, uh, they sometimes mention these minor traumas. I still consider this to be a traumatic. What we saw is the best patient group to treat is the non-operative patient so this is very important. This is key. If you get somebody who was operated seven times and is very painful, likely will not uh, be successful with physiotherapy because just they cannot do it anymore because they have so much pain. And then what we saw clearly for this type of treatment is the younger they are, the more unilateral the affection is and the more athletic and with the lower BMI, BMI they are, so the less fat they have. Actually, these are the ideal patients to treat. So the skinny, young, athletic patient with unilateral affection, that's 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 a home run. That's the, that's the patient, ideal patient for every one of us. That's right. And why should it be different? <laughs> athletic, <laughs> skinny, uh, sportive, and so on. So right. my comment is, uh, the, 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 the final comment for this is that you find a, a really a, a key point in this kind of patient. The key point is that this patient has a problem in the in the in the equilibrium between the anterior and the posterior part of the muscles you know that if an agonism an agonist is working you have even the strength coming from the antagonist and it's it's not possible to work without one without the other one because you have an, it is, if you have a disequilibrium between these two 
you have a, a failing of the of the the static place of the humor head. So this is really interesting. We are still developing the the ideas about this, and we thank you for this for these studies that you are doing because we we are going to understand the the the, the, the treatment. And uh, if you, if we understand how to treat this patient, maybe we can understand even which is the re the real reason for this kind of problems. Because at the moment, these are I think the most difficult patient that we can treat, because the patient would like to have a surgery to solve the problem, but you should visit the patient and you should find that there is nothing wrong in this patient. You should have ex exactly the same range of movement of the different shoulder the same passive movement, the same drawer test, anterior and posterior with the right, with the, with the other shoulder. So you should uh, speak a lot with the patient, explain them that you are doing uh, the most possible, just doing nothing. And uh, the problem is that not all the not all the people that this patient can meet are expert in shoulders, and sometimes they find, uh, we have seen, all of us have seen patients with this kind of problem with the Latergé, first with an anterior bone block, after a posterior bone block, without any results, with the same problem maintaining. So the first suggestion, the first comment is, uh, first of all, we should know the problem. Second, we should speak with the patient. Third, but, but fourth, uh, perhaps the first is, uh, we should visit the patient very well. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. I totally agree. Uh, thank you, Paolo. Uh, we have some questions and some will come and we will discuss both presentations at the end. So we can move on our second presenter, Dr. Patrick Gotti from Switzerland. And Patrick will present his presentation. Yes, Patrick. So uh, thank you to the CSEX and thank you uh, attention. Uh, thank you, Gabor, and uh, thank you also, Paolo, for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to work. So I will share my presentation also. OK, is it visible for everyone? If someone can just confirm. Yes, yes. So um, uh, I will uh, speak about our, about our study regarding um, uh, anterior uh, shoulder stabilization using the Latarge technique. And uh, we uh, try to look at the benefit of sling immobilization doing a randomized control trial. Uh, this idea came up when I was doing my fellowship with uh, Alex Lederman in uh, 2019. And so uh, uh, it was done at uh, his institution. So uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, Alex Lederman has some disclosure, but these are not uh, relevant to, to this study. So traumatic anterior shoulder uh, instability commonly affects young to middle-aged athletes. And uh, in this uh, specific uh, population, we know that the Latarge uh, is a, a good procedure with uh, low recurrence rates. It further enables uh, an early return to sports with, uh, at the mean uh, time of five months uh, post-operatively. So uh, we also know that there is a benefit for uh, early uh, passive uh, uh, assisted motion. And uh, there is a nice publication from uh, the group of uh, Arnaud Godnesch uh, which showed that uh, when uh, using, using a self-rehabilitation immediately after Latarge procedure, you can get uh, uh, excellent results and uh, you don't get uh, more uh, post-operative complication. They used the Lyotard protocol from uh, Lyon, uh, which is resumed in uh, these three pictures. So uh, phase one, days one to seven, you do a stretch uh, supine, Day seven to 30, you do the stretch uh, being sitting or uh, up, up, upright. And uh, starting uh, day 31 to three months postoperatively, you start uh, stretching in external rotation. 
Uh, what remains, however, unclear is the time necessary of immobilization after uh, a lethargy. And uh, there is a nice survey from our colleagues from the ASES, which uh, uh, addressed this question. And uh, you can see about this 240 uh, shoulder surgeon, you see that there is a wide range of uh, immobilization period, but most are doing two to six weeks of immobilization after their lethargy procedure. So these two to six weeks, it's really based on surgeon preference rather than any scientific rationale. And uh, the, uh, what we don't know if there, if there is a protective effect of, of sling immobilization after la tarje regarding uh, recurrent dislocation, uh, graft union, or uh, if it prevents fracture of the graft or screw pullout. So why does it matter? Of course, when you treat a young patient and also athletes, you want to avoid stiffness, especially in external rotation. You want to avoid muscular atrophy. You want to bring this patient back to their daily activities, including driving. And of course, these athletes want or need to stay active and they will somehow do it with or without your formal consent. So the aim of our study was to evaluate the impact of uh, a sling immobilization on short-term clinical outcomes after um, uh, lethargy surgery. And uh, we hypothesized that uh, immediate self-rehabilitation without the sling uh, would uh, result in improved functional outcomes at a six months follow-up compared to a patient wearing a sling for uh, three weeks. So this was a, a randomized controlled trial. Uh, all patients were operated by the senior author uh, using an open latarge with two screws, and they all uh, had uh, immediate uh, passive assisted rehabilitation uh, in, uh, in, in both groups using the Lyotard protocol. If you want further details regarding the, the research protocol, we published it uh, in a trial so you can have access to all details. Inclusion criteria were a uh, patient with uh, anterior shoulder instability and clenoid bone defect uh, over 20 degrees, 20% uh, uh, contact athletes, a uh, patient with failed bank card should be uh, open or arthroscopic, and uh, an age span between 16 and uh, uh, 65 years of age. We uh, excluded patients with uh, subcap tears uh, with uh, preoperative stiffness with dislocation, arthropathy, patient which had the polytrauma or which were known for uh, drug or alcohol abuse and uh, so non-compliance. Uh, so the primary outcome was six fun uh, functional outcome as assessed by the disease specific row score. Secondary outcomes were sane instability score, VIS pain score, and we also assessed radiological outcome using uh, computed tomography at uh, six months using the Hovelius criteria for graft union. So uh, 87 patients were randomized in this trial. Uh, we had no loss to follow up because they were all operated and it was just short-term follow-up. However, uh, some patients did not uh, perform their CT scan at six months, but it was quite comparable and low numbers between uh, both groups. So patient characteristics. So there were uh, quite um, uh, what was expected for a shoulder instability cord. So there were uh, mainly male patients uh, young patients, preoperative range of motion was comparable between both groups. Uh, the only difference uh, was a slightly uh, higher uh, pain score in uh, uh, patients in the sling groups due to hazard, uh, subjective shoulder value uh, assessed by the same uh, instability score and the row score were however comparable. And regarding uh, bone deficit, it was also comparable uh, uh, both uh, glenoid bone loss and uh, on track off track uh, ratio. So the results of our um, study showed no significant difference regarding the VIS pain score between the both groups. It was the same regarding same instability score and same regarding uh, uh, the row score. 
Uh, regarding the radiological results, also there was no significant difference, both regarding uh, bone union, which uh, uh, we had uh, two cases of non-union, uh, both in the sling and no sling group, and uh, osteolysis of the graft was also comparable uh, between uh, both groups. So uh, in conclusion, both uh, treatment groups resulted in uh, excellent early functional outcomes after the open latar we had an overall low rate of 5% of graft union at six months in both groups. And so the absence of postoperative sling immunization did not increase the complication rates in our study. So we adapted our uh, practice and stopped using a sling uh, after open latage. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for, for this uh, interesting uh, topic. and. Uh, it may affect all of our daily practice. And so Dr. Paladini will comment about this uh, study mm -hmm. too. Thanks. Yes, thanks, uh, thanks, Atachan. Thanks, Patrick, for interesting papers. Uh, <laughs> I've seen the, 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 the graphs about the, the time, the weeks of immobilization that you uh, examined in the, in the past. And of course, uh, uh, we as Italian, uh, we are in the middle. We we usually keep the keep the the, the sling for two weeks, and the third is uh, for uh, uh, removing uh, progressively the sling. Uh, this this is made not to uh, not to change. I think the fate of this operation just to give uh, some uh, uh, some comfort to the patient. Do you think that uh, taking a sling? Uh, we have seen that the results are the same. Do you think that taking this this sling, you can you can give some comfort more to the patient that is really quite more more quiet, more tranquil with this differently than a patient without that can move. But not not regarding the final the final outcome because we have seen that even for the complication, the complication of the pseudotrosis is quite the same. So we don't have any problem, but. It can change the, the psychological effect of the patient. Uh, I think you're right with uh, with your remark. And uh, I think there is also no a negative effect uh, or no major negative effect in the, in the findings with the clinical scores, which are comparable. So if you have a patient which is... Uh, uh, really in panic, not wearing a sling or in, in comfort. It's not wrong to put a sling, uh, I would say, for two, three weeks. Um, six weeks, I'm not so sure that this is uh, the, the, the same story, but uh, for three weeks, at least in our study, uh, regarding the functional uh, scores, you can be uh, you can assure him that he will have the same uh, outcome. But on the other hand, if he wants to get a little bit more early, uh, at least back to driving, because in Switzerland, if you wear a sling, you're normally not that allowed to, to take a car or to drive. Then you uh, you could also say it's okay not to wear it if he feels comfortable with uh, with that. So I think it's just an, uh, an another option. And at least for functional outcomes, there is no change. And as, as you saw also but for- in, uh, in the short for time, the, uh, in the short time, yeah. there is no differences. So when yeah. you start when you start with the, uh, for, a, for an active patient, for a patient that is doing some sports, when you start with the, uh, uh, with the reinforcement, when you start with the strengthening of these muscles that you treated- yeah, you, three months. At three months. So there is no changes in the in the normal uh, follow up of this patient. You just change that you did not immobilize this patient for any for any time. Exactly the, the three the three first months. It's really about range of motion and uh, mm -hmm. the strengthening. It should uh, it normally starts later. Okay. But, uh, you and, and do you have some uh, some uh, some advice uh, taking uh, or uh, waiting uh, take bringing some weights or something else? Waters uh, or bags or something else. How do uh, no, you, how you can protect from this? 
Yeah, normally you, 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 we, uh, we advise them. So it was the same recommendation for both patient groups, sling or no sling. So we didn't advise the patient without a sling to uh, lift weight or something like this, because of course, then you could have more trouble regarding uh, uh, the graft and, uh, and, and the complications. So it was really the same rehabilitation, the same protocol of physiotherapy and the same stuff that was allowed. And uh, uh, we don't allow them to to lift weight against resistance with the with the elbow for for the the first three months, and then really we start with the the strengthening uh, exercise. Okay, thank you, Patrick. It was really interesting, and it is opening a new window on the on the treatment that we can have for this kind of patient. In the past, there is a, there was a big discussion on the on the immobilization after the calf procedure, and now I think that this, this kind of uh, new window that you're opening on immobilization after Latarge can give us uh, more opportunities because if you want to continue to 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 bring uh, to, to put a sling in the patient we can continue to do but we know that the results is the same so it depends on the comfort of the patient thank you for this it's a great idea and uh, of course we should take care of these suggestions because this is a level one is a randomized controller trial so we should uh, we should uh, argue that this is the the most important recommendation that we can have. This is not just the experience of Patrick, but this is uh, evidence based medicine. So we should take care of this, and uh, I think that uh, from now we can start uh, uh, even using less this sling. Thank you, Patrick, for this guy great success for this great suggestion. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paolo. Now we can start uh, the discussion uh, all together with our uh, attendees, with, with our participants. Uh, there are some questions already sent um, uh, to Philip, and uh, two questions are similar. Uh, I think everybody is also uh, want, uh, want, want to learn the answer. Uh, one is from Chris Einarsson, uh, from, uh, uh, and the other is from Enrique Peses. They have both asked, which muscles do you put to pacemaker sensor? And the other one asked, were there specific muscle groups targeted or a specific location for the placement of the pacemaker? So thank you very much for, for these questions. Uh, so the sensor itself is placed on the upper arm. It uh, captures the motion of the arm, but more likely you were, you were referring to the electrodes, uh, so the muscle groups that are stimulated then. And uh, this is uh, placed uh, slightly medial to the medial border of the scapula. So this will stimulate the lower trap and the rhomboids. So the scapula will be retracted. And then most importantly, on the external rotators, namely infraspinatus and teres minor. Uh, this will uh, help to adjust the position of the scapula and the external rotators re will reinforce the posterior stabilization of the, of the shoulders. When they contract, they push the humeral head forward. And... Uh... Do do uh, always uh, the pacemaker is placed by a physiotherapist, or do you give uh, education to the patient or their relatives? Uh, thank you again. Very important question. So what I do in my clinical practice is I send patients where I think they could benefit from the pacemaker. For me personally, this is also after after cuff rehabilitation or maybe weak deltoids, if there's a neurological problem or something like that, I send them for one hour to my physiotherapist. They train and see whether the patients like it. And if they like it, they place some uh, some skin markers, like some uh, permanent marker, like, like you use to draw something on the skin, make a little cross on both places. And then the patients rent the device and use it at home so they know exactly where to place the electrodes without further instruction because the device includes like an app uh, it's built like a computer game, which you can follow and, and play level by level. You can increase uh, the, the difficulty of the levels. And so it's it's quite easy to, to use yourself at home. Actually, this is similar like biofeedback. Is, is that, uh, can, can we tell, can we call this as, as a kind of biofeedback or? That's a good question. I actually like, 
to use a term that Andrew Jaggi, she is one of the the leading physiotherapists in Europe. Uh, she has done extensive research on this topic, and she once this is now quite some years ago. She once called it feet forward rather than feet back because what you're doing is showing the patients which muscle they need to activate so that the shoulder stays centered because the difficulty with regular physiotherapy is how do you teach the patient to activate a muscle group they kind of forgot about i always say it's similar to when you're not able to wiggle your ears you know some some humans are able to move their ears and others are not but we all have the same muscles so why is this because some can just guide the activation of these muscles and what we are trying to do is teach these patients how they can activate these muscles again. I always thought this needs to be an implanted stimulator, like a, like a heart pacemaker. But we learned that the patients can actually retrain the, the brain function. And so they learn it and they need it just for a limited period of time. And there's another question from Maciej Bohene uh, asks, uh, patients with a traumatic voluntary instability have sometimes delicate psychological structure. How are they tolerating this pacemaker? Again, uh, great question. So first of all, we should be very careful not to call these patients psychiatric because we have done so in the past. You know, we operate them three times, four times, five times, six times. It fails. And then we start to call them crazy. I would say it's likely crazy to operate them six times rather than calling the patient crazy. We did a, a psychological evaluation of a patient cohort of more than 30, of 30 patients. We saw that these patients are just regular teenagers. However, you're completely right. They sometimes can be quite, um, yes, a little bit scared, obviously, maybe introverted. But you have to realize that these patients have a severely debilitating pathology that looks a little bit freakish at a very vulnerable age. So if you are 13, 14, and you have a, a freakish pathology uh, that everybody makes fun of you, it's likely not the easiest uh, upgrowing that you have. So we need to be very careful with these patients. And I completely agree. We need to counsel these patients very closely and help them also psychologically. But we should not call them crazy. So complete it's, difference between It's them. the same problem that we have with the patient with the uh, adhesive capsulitis they are uh, struggling from the from from the pain they cannot do nothing and uh, it's they are first depressed or first uh, stiff so it's it's so difficult so difficult we should do this this kind of uh, evaluation of counseling of all the patient of the same age and if you we find that on the depressed people there is a a big part of this having this kind of posterior dislocation we we can change but we cannot do just on the patient with the problem to find the the, the psychological disorder we have to we have to follow up all the population of the same age to find some answer it is impossible there is if i may uh, something there is a very interesting study that has been published uh, from researchers in the uk they placed patients, like I presented in, in, in my presentation, in a functional MRI, brain MRI. And they tried to see what's going on in the brain of these patients. What they saw is they have activation patterns in their brain that are very different from a regular control group. They are very similar than uh, how little children learn new tasks. So this tells us that these patients, they are trying, but they don't know how. We need to teach them. And that's the most difficult thing because we cannot teach them by surgery. And so that's where we surgeons kind of get stuck and we don't know what to do, uh, anything else, right? One more fast question, Philip, if you don't mind. How often do you ask your patients to have the treatment each day? This is question number one. And how often do you see them? How often do you call them back for a follow-up just to check? And do you do it or your physiotherapist does it? So my physiotherapists do it uh, and then, however, they send the patients home and they do it as, as a home training program and, uh, and uh, they can supervise it via the app, what the patients are doing, what activation level and so on. 
we recommend a minimum of three times per week so the muscles can also recover a little bit maybe later down the training you can do it a little bit more frequently and we go for a minimum of six weeks as we did in the study however nowadays i go for a minimum of three months because the more you train the more it's burnt into your brain it's like when you learn a new sport golf tennis whatever you like you need to train 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 so that it gets stuck in your motor memory okay thank you another question from audience is there any contraindication for using pacemaker uh, this will be the typical contraindications uh, as for example uh, the if you wear uh, like a like a internal cardiac defibrillator you know typical contraindications for electrical muscle stimulation uh, and then i would add one if the patient is so painful that you cannot do the training then it's a contraindication obviously because then you cannot ju just not apply it. this is typically the previously operated patients okay okay uh when well that's question i think this is also for you have you also associated a work for stretching and relaxation of latissimus dorsi so I have not a standard for stretching of the latissimus dorsi. However, we have one patient uh, uh, that is from Berlin where I formerly worked, uh, where actually we were not able to get any success with pacemaker um, and surgery and so on. And there actually, uh, a colleague of mine, um, we decided together to detach the latissimus dorsi uh, in order to deactivate it. This has been something that has been suggested uh, by JP Warner, for example, and it has brought some benefit, but not 100%. And so this is definitely something to consider. We have hyperactive muscles on one side, which you can stimulate. It's just much more difficult to deactivate hyperactive muscles. Yes, you can cut them, but this is quite invasive. And so, but yes, you should look on both sides. That's completely right. For me personally, I go for the easier task, which is stimulate what was hypoactive. Okay. And uh, some questions for the Patrick too. Uh, 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 Patrick, you have, I think you have answered, but from the Q and A. But I want to ask for live too. Uh, thank you very much for for your nice presentation too. And are patients allowed full active range of motion after open metage immediately after surgery, or? Uh, they are not uh, if they are not in the sling are they told to actively move the arm so so um thank you for the question so um it both groups had exactly the same recommendation and the same rehabilitation protocol which is the one uh, uh, that was published by uh, Arno Godnesh after his Latarge. And so it's the Lyotard protocol. So it's uh, passive assisted. So it's the stretch uh, I showed on the slide. So you, you start stretching uh, overhead uh, for the first month and then you go uh, towards uh, external rotation with the, the, the stretch uh, on, on the side starting at, uh, at one month. So, uh, of course, the recommendation is not to do uh, some uh, weightlifting, as uh, Paolo mentioned, or to, to work with weights, because then, uh, of course, uh, it's too early to do this uh, uh, straight uh, after surgery. Uh, as you have shown in your uh, slides, uh, the, these people are mostly very active, sometimes hyperactive uh, the the one with the uh, needle operated uh, doing cycling they always want to make uh, sports and uh, as I, I have also learned from my patients that they don't need the sling uh, because they, they come in the first visit after one week with music and is was this also come uh, all, did, did you get this idea also from the feedbacks from your patients or was it your uh, this was a series of ideas a rotator cuff instability without sling so the id came actually when i was the i was with uh, alex Lederman doing my fellowship in 2019 and it was just the year he published his uh, paper in jbgs about the rehabilitation uh, after a cuff surgery where he also removed the sling for small tears 
And uh, we saw a patient exactly as you told, like uh, at uh, two weeks after the lethargy, and you clearly saw that uh, probably he was not wearing the sling because uh, he already had uh, a comparable range of motion. And so uh, I asked him if we should not do the same for instability patient. And this was the, the where the, the idea actually came uh, came from. And uh, do, do you also uh, courageous enough to use no sling after uh, arthroscopic bank art repairs? Uh, actually, I, I do really mainly uh, lethargy. So uh, for the, the bank art repairs, I would be a little bit more cautious because uh, I think the stability of the of the labrum with the with the anchors might not be the same uh, as with the, the stability you get with the screws when doing a latarge. And I think also maybe if you do the latarge using end of buttons uh, rather than screws, uh, you should also take some caution when uh, looking at our results because the initial stability with uh, the end of buttons might not be the same as with the screws. So I think this could be a benefit also uh, one more for the, the, the latarge and the screws. Of course, there are also uh, downsides to, to using screws with the, the latarge. So I'm also not telling that it's uh, just do it with screws, but this could explain why you can move them early without uh, uh, too much complication, at least on the yeah. short-term follow-up. Huh? At least from this study, we can only uh, advise for the latarges with screws or, uh, without sling, uh, as you mentioned. Excellent. Yes. And one last question came for um, Philip too. Do you feel the patient can be trained to activate their muscles without the pacemaker, but by a physio who specializes in shoulder stability and muscle training? I think your study already given this answer because there are 15 patients cross over to the uh, to the uh, pacemaker side. I mean the 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 question is uh, is a good question. Uh, however, yeah. what we did the control group was actually uh, the best possible physiotherapy protocol that we could get from experts who have published on this topic in the past via a Delphi survey. So we really took guys who published on this. So they are likely experts in the field. We asked them what kind of exercises do we want to do for these patients. Uh, and uh, and they all agreed on a certain protocol. And that's the protocol that we used as control. So and the, the outcome was not great. So I'm not saying it's not possible because we also have some good results with, with non-operative treatment, which is conventional physiotherapy. However, in several patients, it does not work. And in these patients, even it seems to be a benefit if you have this physiotherapist not replaced, but aided by the neuromuscular electrical stimulation. That's, that's what we can claim. And from your slides, I have seen that you have, or, or other people have used this pacemaker in the uh, sports people, even in co competitive levels. Do you think that this can be used? Uh, the this the system can be used for uh, the um, performance, not only for the uh, treatment of posterior instability, also performance of the uh, athletes. That's a good question. I mean, we were surprised that uh, Olympic athletes, uh, the Italian Olympic Federation, and others, volleyball players, now baseball players, even have picked this up in an attempt to increase performance. Obviously, we, we like to see that, but I have no scientific data that can back this up. So uh, I'm still a scientist. So I would say I cannot prove you that this is the case. We only have single uh, episodes of, of athletes who, who, who believe their performance is increased, but this is not scientific. And so I, I cannot claim this to be true. Okay. And I would like, there are always many questions, but I would like to, we are out of time. Thank you very much for contributing our uh, webinar, which will continue with other uh, series of best papers. And uh, I will give Gabor 